KSJE and the Farmington Public Library present Quinto's Hana and Tales. Hello, my name is Beth from the Farmington Public Library, and I am here to read you some books from our uh, collection. The first book that I picked out is called The Cajun Gingerbread Boy. Actually, it's called The Cajun Cornbread Boy. It is based off the gingerbread man. And it is a well-loved tale spiced up by Diane de las Casas. So we are going to do the gingerbread boy in Cajun style. So this is the Cajun cornbread boy. The Cajun cornbread boy. Down by the bayou there lived an old Cajun woman who had no children. More than anything, she wanted a child. One day, she decided to make a cornbread boy. She put the ingredients into a bowl, adding a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a big dash of cayenne pepper. Finally, she poured the batter into a black iron skillet. She said, My grandmare used this old skillet often to make magic cornbread. It should do the trick. On top of the batter, she added two chilies for the eyes, a peppercorn for the nose, and a link of bourdin for the mouth. Mmm, mmm, mmm. She placed the cornbread boy into the oven, and soon he was all done. When the old woman opened the oven, she added two pats of butter for the cheeks, but surprise, surprise, that round cornbread boy spread his arms and legs, jumped up and ran out the front door. He cried, run, Sherry, run as fast as you can. You can't catch me. I'm full of cayenne. The Cajun cornbread boy ran into the woods. The old woman began chasing him with a jump and a skip and a hop, yelling, please stop. Stop, cornbread boy, stop! But the cayenne cornbread boy sprinted away. Soon he came upon a rascally raccoon. The raccoon eyed the cornbread boy hungrily and asked, Won't you stop, cornbread boy? I love to have you for breakfast. But the Cajun cornbread boy did not stop. He kept running, crying, Run, Cher, run, as fast as you can. You can't catch me, I'm full of cayenne. The raccoon began chasing him with a jump, a skip and a hop, yelling, Please stop, cornbread boy, stop. But the cayenne cornbread boy sprinted away. The, ki- the Cajun cornbread boy ran deeper into the woods. Next, he came across a fierce fox. The fox eyed the cornbread boy hungrily and asked, Won't you stop, cornbread boy? I'd love to have you for lunch. But the Cajun cornbread boy did not stop. He kept running, crying, Run, Cher, run as fast as you can. You can't catch me. I'm full of cayenne. The fox began chasing him with a jump, a skip, and a hop, yelling, Please stop, cornbread boy, stop. But the Cajun cornbread boy sprinted away. The Cajun cornbread boy ran until he came to a bayou. He wanted to cross the water to get away from the fox, but he could not. He didn't know how to swim. By and by, an artful alligator swam to the shore. Bonjour, cornbread boy. Are you crossing the bayou? I can't swim. How will I get across? asked the cornbread boy. Well, said the alligator slyly, I could swim you across, and once we got to the other side, I'd love to have you for dinner. The gator gave a big toothy grin. For sure, said the cornbread boy. So he hopped onto the gator's back, and they began to cross the bayou. As they went further across the bayou, the water got deeper and deeper and deeper. 
the Cajun cornbread boy had to move further and farther up Gator's back until he was finally on Gator's snout. When they came to the opposite bank, Gator jumped up, sending the cornbread boy flying into the air and into Gator's mouth. But something funny happened. That cornbread boy was so spicy he set Gator's tongue on fire. Gator spit him out and swam away lickety-split. The Cajuns down by the bayou say that they still see the Gator swimming around with his mouth wide open, fanning himself. Gator sure learned his lesson. Playing tricks can backfire. You can Bet he won't be eating any more spicy Cajun cornbread. As for the Cajun cornbread boy, to this day, you can still hear him singing, Run, Sharon, run, as fast as you can. You can't catch me. I'm full of cayenne. So that was the Cajun cornbread boy by Diane de las Casas. Okay, so I would like to read you another tale. And this is a story about why the crawfish lives in the mud. And this is written and illustrated by Jonette Downing. So this is why the crawfish lives in the mud. And it starts with long ago, the waters of the bayou, the crab and the crawfish used to be best friends. That is, until one hot muggy day when crawfish was feeling more lazy than usual. Crawfish was getting hungry, but he would not budge an inch to find a meal for himself. Then crawfish heard a loud commotion and saw a crab carrying a fish he had caught in his claws. Suddenly, crawfish had the envy, the craving for fish, which caused another loud racket in his hungry stomach. Crawfish rubbed his belly, thought for a moment, and concocted a plan and said, Sure is a hot one, eh, crab? That it is, replied crab, balancing the fish in one claw and wiping the sweat of hard work from his brow with the other. That fish sure looks good, said Crawfish. Ah, yes, indeed it does, said Crab. Well, I declare you are just too strong to carry such a small fish as that, said Crawfish. A, s a small fish? asked Crab. Oh, yeah, Cher, replied Crawfish mockingly. As strong as you are, you probably can't even feel that small, tiny fish you got there. Now, one of those big fish down the bayou would give you a run for your money. Big fish? Bigger than this one? asked Crab. Oh, yeah, much bigger than that small, tiny, tiny, itsy, bitsy fish you got there. Much bigger. Now that big fish down the bayou would be some fun eating for you. Yes, indeed, some fun eating, answered Crawfish. Crab looked at his catch of the day and suddenly didn't feel so heavy and it didn't feel so look so very big either. Lazy crawfish laid it on thick again and said, "Of course, that small, tiny, tiny itsy bitsy puny fish you got yourself there would be fine it eaten for a weak little crawfish like me. But you're so big and strong, you'd need something bigger, much bigger, but." That's life. I guess I'll go get that big fish down the bayou and try to drag it home. I'll probably hurt my back trying. Crab put down his dinner and said, Oh, no, I wouldn't want you to hurt yourself. 
dear friend crawfish, here, you take my little fish and I'll go down the bayou and get that big fish. You would do that for me, said crawfish, hiding his devious grin. Sure I would, said crab as he handed his dinner to crawfish and marched down the bayou. Crawfish laughed and laughed at the foolish crab. Ha, 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 ha. I've outsmarted that silly crab again, said Crawfish. He laughed so hard that he turned red all over. Then Crawfish ate until he could eat no more, rubbed his full tummy, and took a long nap in the southern sun. Click, click, click. Suddenly, Crawfish heard a sound. Click, click, click. The sound came again, but this time it was closer and louder. Crawfish woke up from his nap to find angry crab standing over him, clicking his mighty claws together. Crab yelled, You lazy trickster, I walked up and down the bayou looking for that big fish, and found none. Crawfish looked up a little because he could tell that Crab was some furious. Crab said, You played another dirty trick and made a fool out of me for the last time. Crawfish backed up a little more. He had never seen Crab this angry before. Crab continued, And to think I gave you my dinner because I felt sorry for you. Crawfish packed up a little more, trying to compose himself, and said, Oh, you know I'm just a trickster. You know crazy. There's no need for you to be so crabby. Crab replied, Crabby, why I should throw you into the mud for pulling such a dirty trick on me. Oh, no, not the mud. I don't like the mud, cried Crawfish. I'll get stuck in the mud and never come out. Anything, oh, anything but the mud. Now a frightened crawfish was backing away from Crab so fast and flicking his fantail so frantically that he unknowingly dug a deep tunnel in the mug and fell into it with a plop. Clouds of mud circled the tunnel's entrance and crawfish burrowed inside was hidden from sight. Crab couldn't believe his eyes. Well, I'll be what Goes around, comes around, said Crab. I guess you outsmarted yourself this time and got exactly what you deserved. Now the mud will be your home forever. And to this day, the crawfish, also known as the mud bug, lives in the mud to keep away from the angry crab. Oh, right. So this is why the crawfish lives in the mud. So that was a fun tale. So the next story that I would like to see, to read to you is called The Crane Girl, adapted by Curtis Manley. And I'd like you to know that, that in, interspersed in the story are haikus. But I'm not going to read the haikus today. But if you're interested, you can come over to the library and check it out. It's in the easy section under E-M-A-N-C. It's called The Crane Girl. Yasahiro dropped his arm load of firewood to follow the sound across the sharp buckwheat stubble of the landlord's field. He almost stepped on the crane, nearly invisible, where it lay in the snow. A trap held one foot, but the crane looked unharmed. As Yasahiro knelt, the bird closed his eyes and shuddered. Yasahiro clicked his tongue to calm the bird. I'm not here to hurt you. When the bird stood up, it was as tall as Yasuhiro. He stroked the soft feathers on his long neck with his fingertips, and the bird gently pressed the red top of his head against Yasuhiro's face.
The crane suddenly turned away, began running, and took flight over the wintry hills. Yasuhiro watched until the bird was a pale speck against the dark sky. Then he picked up his firewood his father had sent him for and hurried home. The next night, someone knocked on the door. Yasuhiro opened it and found a girl standing there, pale and shivering, tears frozen on her cheeks. Please, she said, bowing, I have no home and nothing to eat. May I, may I stay here with you? I will help with chores. I won't be any trouble. Yasuhiro led her to the warmth of the hearth. Father will decide whether you can stay. Yasuhiro's father, Ryota, got up and bowed. We are not rich like others in town, but you are welcome here as long as you work hard. If you are lazy or steal from me, you cannot stay. Do you agree to that? Yes, sir, the girl said and bowed again. Thank you. You may call me Hiroko. Yasuhiro and Hiroko became friends. They shared their chores and spent their time together. Each morning, Ryoto walked to town looking for work unloading boats or carrying heavy baskets. He returned in the evening, and find, usually with fish or noodles. But when he couldn't find work, he came home with only his sadness, crying the name of Yasuhiro's mother. Mother died when I was young, Yasuhiro whispered to Hiroko one of those nights. Father says she wove the finest kimono silk on the whole island. We still have her loom and thread, but father had to sell all the fabric she made. Except my scarf. Oh, yes, so oh, it's so beautiful, Hiroko said as she stroked the soft fabric. The next day, Hiroko bowed to Ryota. If it would please you, Ryota san, I will weave silk for you. It will bring a good price in the market. I have but one request. Neither you nor Yasuhiro must open the door or look at me while I am weaving, no matter how long I might take. Do you agree to that? Yasuhiro and Ryota nodded and said, Yes. Then I will weave for you. She took the bowl of rice and bean sprouts that Yasuhiro offered and closed the door. The loom sounded all that night and the next day. Only after dinner did it fall silent. When Hiroko finally opened the door, she was carrying a bolt of cloth as light as the summer breeze. A merchant brought the silk as much gold as Ryota could earn in five months. Now Ryota often slept late, but the by the time he walked into the village, there was no work left. Instead, he sat with merchants in the warm sun, eating and drinking all afternoon. The gold was gone in just three months. So again, Hiroko closed the door to weave, taking with her a bowl of tofu and ginger that Yasuhiro had prepared for her. This time, the girl spent two full days with the loom. The fabric was even finer than before. A merchant paid so much that Ryota stopped even trying to look for work. He went to town only to sit by the docks with the merchants and boast of the fine silk he would weave for them. In a few months, all the gold was spent again. More cloth, demanded Ryota. Hiroko looked down at the floor. I am still too weak, sir. Next month I will weave more. You will do it now and Insisted Ryota, and before Yasuro Hiro could stop him, Ryota pushed the girl into the room and slid the door shut. Yasuro Hiro looked at the door and remembered his promise to Hiroka never to open it. A day passed, then another. The loom's rhythm seemed slower with each passing hour. Ryota paced back and forth. Finally, the loom fell quiet. Are you done with the cloth? Ryota asked and slid the door open. He cried out and fell onto the floor. Yerosha rushed toward his father but stopped and stared. Through the door he saw a long thin neck and feathers flecked with blood and then a great wing slammed the door shut. Ryota ran past Yashihiro and stumbled outside into the darkness. When Hiroka finally came out, her face was pale. Her eyes were red from crying. Yasu, here is a silk for your father. 
Once he sells it, he need not bear any burdens for many months. I'm sorry about father, Yasuhiro Hiro said, gazing down at the fabric. Hiroko pressed her head against him. Hiroko thought of what he'd seen through the open door and touched Hiroko's neck. Why did you pluck your own feathers for the cloth? You saved my life when I was caught in the trap, said the girl. You were so gentle and kind. I wanted to be with you. Hiroko pulled away from him. But I can stay no longer. She hurried outside and within three steps changed back into a crane and flew away. Hiroko ran and ran, calling after her and sobbing. When she was just a dark speck in the dawn sky, he could run no more. He must have fallen asleep, for suddenly Hiroko was bending over him. Yasu, go home. You will freeze here in the snow. I won't go back, said Yasuhiro. Take me with you. Hiroko shook her head. Our life is too different. It is a hard life. You wouldn't like it. I will like it, because I'll be with you. Then follow me. She began running, and flap your wings hard. But I don't have... But he did. He did have wings. Together, they flew low over the hills and along the river to the marshes at the edge of the sea. Her people clapped their beaks in welcome and danced for them. Yasuhiro and Hiroko stayed together all the rest of their long lives and, ra and raised many crane children one by one. Spring sun, our chick's feathers wet from the egg. How lucky we all are to be cranes. So that was the crane girl. Adapted by Curtis Manley. This is Beth from the Farmington Public Library. Thank you for listening. Uh, you're welcome to come by to the Farmington Public Library to check out books from our collection. This has been Quintos Hana and Tales, presented by the Farmington Public Library and KSJE 90.9 FM.